Hey folks, Mark Scroggins. Andrew Johnson here. Back for uh, a little bit more of Love and Money. So continuing on some of the stuff we were talking about, I just saw this interesting article uh, about JP Morgan's million dollar pocket watch vanished. Yeah, just... I mean, you know, just di- disappears into the ether somewhere. Yeah, it sounds very Thomas Crowney, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Very, very <laughs> much so. So what this made me think about a little bit are some other areas where you know far more than I do. Um, but one of the things that I see in, uh, in, in my work a lot, which is people have a lot of investments in what I would call non-traditional um, assets. So I know you and I both... Part of the reason, obviously, that this caught my eye is you know that I'm a bit of a you know watch fiend, uh, much like you are, yes. and uh, so that you know I find very intriguing anytime people are talking about you know obscure watches and shit like that. It just sure. makes me makes me think. But that has become a really interesting investment tool for a lot of people, and it watch sure collections has. have gone astronomical. I, I have a client of mine who uh, he is uh, a successful construction. A subcontractor does a lot of work, builds a lot of buildings in Dallas, and I'd say, you know, hopefully he doesn't get too mad at me for disclosing this, but about a, a fourth of his net worth is in watches. Right. And he and it's uh, it's he he has a watch like row in his collector box. He calls billionaires row of uh, of his Patek Philippe's, his Nautilus, you know, this the, uh, the 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 big named items, the 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 oh my gosh, the platinum Daytonas kind of things, you know, the, right. the things that are very hard to get. In this uh, in this day and age now, because you can used to be able to walk into an AP Artemis Brugé uh, boutique about four years ago, and there'd be like thirty watches in the case, right? Lots of Rolex you could just buy, and um, now you walk into the store in Hound Park Village, and there are literally zero watches in the case, right? Yeah, Rolex boutique coming up recently, which is uh, to much fanfare, right? And so, you know, people just don't understand that this world has just completely gone bonkers, and we'll see how it continues to trend. You know, it's interesting because I, uh, so I have a, I deal with a Rolex dealership in, in Las Vegas and I go out to Vegas probably four or five times a year. And, uh, and so I was out there and there's one, one woman in particular that I deal with and I've had some stuff on order for a while that hasn't come in, but I went in and it was the first time I had gone into a Rolex boutique in a few years. Cause usually I'm just dealing with her over the phone now. Um, but walked in and it was like what you were talking about. I mean, there wasn't shit there, except I think there was a, you know, a 28 mil, oh, you know? Yeah. Uh, so that's like, for those of you, that's a very tiny women's watch that like my mother would wear mm-hmm. and they're beautiful, but they're, you know, they're the ones that probably have the, the least traffic of any, you know, any sold. Yeah. And a lot of women are wearing uh, men's sport ones. watches now. So, you know, the 40 millimeters, 41 millimeters is, is a, to have a, actually when I was in the Rolex boutique a few days ago, there was a woman that walked in and she was very elegantly dressed and she goes i'd like a i'd like a submariner please which is uh, which is this watch which is traditionally a men's sports watch and right she rocked the shot she looked yeah. great you know wearing it and they pulled one of the back for her so she obviously must have known somebody exactly <laughs> exactly but that just that made me think about other different uh investment areas that i see now like you know people getting into uh you know cryptos and then there's the one you and i have talked about a number of time nfts yes. that i just for the life of me i don't get it I just yeah. don't get it. I think NFTs are, uh, you have to assign the same amount of, I guess, allure and luster and I don't get it factor to art. Some people find art to be extremely uh, valuable and, and the, the rich have long traded in in art as a, as a tax haven and a commodity of status. But NFTs are the next generation. You know, we're, we're beginning to see this environment develop in the, particularly with the metaverse afoot and with Elon spotting out that uh, we're going to have chips in our brains in a year from now which I'll let him try that first. Uh, but I think what's really fascinating is NFTs are, um, I, I don't think they're necessarily a fad. I and don't. just so everybody understands, NFT, it's non-fungible a, token. Non-fungible token. So, so if you can define that. Sure. So non- <laughs> non-fungible token in, in its base element is like a, uh, almost like a single cryptocurrency. It's a single crypto uh, item that's on the blockchain that cannot be replicated. So it is a unique item that exists. And therefore you can assign a, an interesting value to it. There's, uh, there were only several projects that were out there, but they were going for astronomic values, and there's been an explosion in NFT projects that are, are coming. So, one of the projects I'd like to highlight actually is something called Tronic. So, uh, local Dallas team is innovating this, and this is a 
project that is going to be really awesome to commercialize NFTs, huh. particularly their status in the metaverse. And it will really help with like, you know, real estate acquisition in their virtual world right. and things like that. But Tronic is a platform that's already going to partner with some major brands, uh, major sports organizations that will allow them to launch the likeness of their products on an NFT. And I think it's something that's very worth investing in. You know, it's interesting because I was reading an article earlier today about a new company called Air, okay. H-E-I-R, right. that is- I'm intrigued. That was started by- An Air? Close, oh. who is his airness. Ah. Michael Jordan and ah. his son. Oh, yes. wow, okay. And have gotten 10 million in funding and it's gonna be built on the Solana blockchain. Okay. Right. So, and it is, uh, and then there are a couple others that have been started. Um, God, what's his name? Pinwitty. It's another a player for the Nets, I think. Uh, anyway, you're starting to see a lot of the athletes really get on the cutting edge of a lot of this stuff. And the the idea behind it is it's a way for them to uh, interact on a much more close basis, but be able to uh, provide some really unique things to their, what I would call super fans, because that's the only way you get that really, kind of access. It really it's scratches be a that like, shit ton of money. That collector's itch, right? You right. Know, because the super fans are huge. And I, I'm sure you've seen there's been a big resurgence of Pokemon cards, for example. Right. Like people are going crazy about those again. Yep. Your first generation Charizard card in pristine condition is going for like a million dollars. It's absurd. And I probably have one of those somewhere in an attic, you know, and just like just burning money in, in, in my a hole in my pocket. So I gotta find that. But um, <laughs> I'm like confident. I'm confident I had one of those, and so I'm trying to find where it is. It's it's a whole problem in my world. So let me ask you about with with these types of things we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's you know. So when I'm looking at when I'm representing someone in a divorce, and we're down to, uh, you know, the the division of the marital estate, and we're looking at different assets, you know we have business valuations done. We might have a real estate um, uh, appraiser involved. We typically are gonna have different real estate agents involved to also get that on top of the appraisal and look at some different things. Anyway, there, there's some pretty easy, I mean, obviously people argue over this shit all day long, but there are what are pretty traditional ways of understanding what the value or what the range of values are. Um, and I see some of this stuff is going to be cuckoo kachu on how the hell do we figure some of this stuff out? I, I, I don't think that you can uh, really because I mean, even just the base crypto yeah. stuff. I mean, what what's hot now? Well, shit, something goes up by 30% almost every day. It's me very challenging for someone in your position to assign a value to that because it's it, the, the market doesn't close, right? It's open 24 seven. And uh, it's always it's, it's very, very, very parabolic. So you're going to see times where Earlier this year, we had a massive slump in crypto, and now we're, we've, we've touched on all-time highs again. But I think the biggest thing, there's a real-world implication of this that I'm dealing with with the current client right now, is that uh, I happen to know that one of the parties in the divorce uh, owned or bragged about owning a lot of cryptocurrency uh, years ago and said he never sold it. And it is now the onus of the uh, leaving party to try to figure out, you know, hey, how much crypto do I have? And it's not exactly that hard to conceal crypto assets. No so kidding. So that's a really big issue as well because you know, your your spouse might be might have a mass cryptocurrency in a wallet that requires no KYC, which is know your client or any sort of AML practices because there's a million ways to do when it. When you say AML practices, that's anti money laundering practices because the, the big guys like Coinbase, uh, who IPO'd this past year, are you know interested in cooperating with the United States government. Right. Right. But there's plenty of exchanges, plenty of places to buy crypto. There's even like crypto dealers. That you can give them fiat currency and they'll put money into an, a Bitcoin into an account for you or into a wallet for you, as it's called. And uh, there's no way your spouse would ever know that was taken out. You right. Know, they have to find that. And I quite frankly, the case that I'm referencing, I don't think she's ever going to know how much money this guy has. Uh, I think you're right. I mean, that's the, <clears throat> correct me if I'm wrong, but. That's one of those deals that unless you are lucky and have some piece of paper, whether handwritten or whether it's an email with, you know, one of these wallet, uh, one of these different entities that's storing the crypto, good luck on searching and trying to find it because they're, you know, you've got so many, like you were talking about that are outside 
uh, outside of the U.S. that, you know, they're... They don't have to comply. No, and, they don't have to do well, a damn I, thing. I don't envy you in that case because it's going to be... There's going to be an eventual industry or technology that is able to find crypto in cases like those. Right. I think it's going to start at the federal government level where they're trying to track down taxes on crypto. And that's actually a pretty interesting thing that we can buzz on really quick is... You know, the taxation element of crypto is very amb ambiguous right now. Right. We don't know if, because in its purest form, crypto is still a very highly appreciating asset. Right. But if it's supposed to be used as a currency too, you know, if we <laughs> buy something and it's appreciated, we need to pay taxes on our money. So right. it's really strange because I don't have to pay a capital gain when I whip out a $100 bill and buy something, you know, at a store. Right. Just it's it's a very difficult landscape for the U.S. government, and they're going to figure out because they need that money uh, how to track this stuff down these transactions better, which hopefully will lend ease to you. I hope so. I mean, that I think uh, you know is kind of the natural starting point for it, anyway, is to think that it becomes you know Big Brother is looking to you know put someone away, and more importantly to them, get the uh, get their hands on that tax, uh, the tax money, and then all the penalties and interest that they can assess on top of that. Um, you know, but it just makes it very interesting. I mean, cause as a, you know, there's, there's fluctuation in the value of currency. If you're a currency trader, you know, if sure. you're going, you know, from U S dollars to Lira or what, whatever the hell you're doing, there's going to be some fluctuation, but within certain limits, generally, unless you've got mass inflation and, and things like that, which can take place, but it just, uh, it's interesting to me because crypto, the nature of it has become much more like you're playing in the stock market. Uh, than as a traditional currency. It is. And, and, and to go back to NFTs for one moment, I think I, we talked about this offline. If you're considering becoming an investor in NFT, right. I think the only piece of advice I can give you is that uh, prepare for a lot of these projects to be virtually worthless down the line. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to take, this is, this is even much more of a frontier market than crypto is, and crypto is still considered widely a very frontier market. So, um, buy things that appeal to you from a project perspective. I think that you're gonna see a brands or, or companies like this Tronic that I mentioned, it's a Dallas-based startup, that are gonna come out to the market and they're gonna really create some valuations and rules around NFTs that will help uh, support a longer life and value of these things. And obviously brands are gonna play a huge component into uh, creating very valuable NFTs because you can go into things like as crazy as um, you know, the MLB is to as crazy as pornography. He's right. going to throw it out there that there might be like, you know, collect them all for your favorite porn star. Right. So it's, um, it's, it's wild what's, what's out there. <laughs> that would make for some very interesting uh, NFTs, I would say. It definitely would. Let's talk about one thing real quick. Uh, and then I want to, after our next break, I want to come back and talk about a little bit of something that um, has really taken off. And that is what I refer to as silver divorces or divorces over 50. Mm. Um, I that. Yeah. So there's a, there's, that is something that uh, there, God, I'm trying to remember the name of the psychologist, but he was asked about that. And he said, if, uh, if divorce over 50 were a disease, it'd be a pandemic <laughs> because it has, uh, it has increased by uh, it's doubled, you know, in the last 10 years. And uh, so there are a whole lot of things that, that go into that, that make it very interesting to me trying not to go off on that tangent, but let's, um, one of the things that is interesting is talking about what the divorce rates are. And so one of the things based on state by state in 20, uh, 2021 with Western cultures, uh, you have a 50% divorce rate of a first marriage, 60% of a second. That's what always cracks me up because I have so many friends that obviously know what, what the hell I do. And they're like, oh, but this is my second marriage. So the likelihood of that ending in divorce is much less, my right? I'm like, no, dude, improve. it's just better. Do you yeah. want to just, do you just want to keep me on retainer? That's, what do you want to do? I was going to say, <laughs> you probably are happy when you hear it. So yeah, this is our second time around. Well, hey, that retainer is coming soon. So. There you go. And even better, a third one, 73%. I think you're just a glutton for punishment if you're getting married for a third time, to be honest. I tend to agree with that. I, there uh, is. I, I think that uh, my, my friends and I joked that we're going to be married once, and if that doesn't work out, we're done with marriage. It's like it's, it's, a, it's probably the most challenging commitment you've ever made, and uh, it, it accompanies so many unforeseen things down the road. If things don't work out, it's far more scary than any sort of business relationship you can make. 
uh, from a financial perspective. And so make sure that person you love the first time is the right one. That's, that's or else <laughs> just, uh, you know, live in sin, do it, do it the right way. Yeah. So. Good. Uh, good luck with yeah, that. Exactly. So it's like, I think Bill Burr, who's one of my favorite comedians had, uh, one of the best stand-up acts uh, related to this. He says, who looks at it and goes, you know, hey, if this doesn't work out, where's the line that I can get? Where, where can I get in line to give away half my shit? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, Well, before we dive more into the love element of the podcast, let's take a quick break, and uh, we appreciate you. We'll see you right back here in a few. Thanks, folks. <laughs>